talked about your retreat. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm not sure what to say. Uh, I, it went well. I liked it. It was really fun. Uh, it was uh, really nice to like uh, see all of the stuff that kind of comes up when one puts uh, when we put ourselves under, uh, you know, I guess a, a process like that. Uh, I think the whole thing was like really nice. I liked it. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, made good friends by the last day and that sort of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Really good, really fun. Uh, and uh, yeah, then after that, I went for three weeks back to my home country and spent some holidays there. So that was really nice too. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't think I have a, a much like in specific or particular to talk about uh um well one thing that i can say is is that you you're more prepared than most to do a goenka retreat because most people don't enjoy it yeah i mean it wasn't easy you know like um i guess like body pain all over the place and stuff like that but then i uh, mm -hmm. by the like the second like third day maybe third day I noticed the like, uh, uh, I don't know, it's almost like something clicked and like the pain just stopped being a problem entirely. Uh, like the pain was there just the same, but it was just not a problem, you know? I guess it's like the, you know, like how pain is different from suffering and there was pain, but there was no suffering from, uh, derived from the pain. So that was very um, insightful, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, um, so that was that was nice. And then though I also had like a, uh, I had like visual hallucinations as I was like transitioning to like sleep, or as I was uh, taking like uh, really short naps, like during the you know that longer period of of lunch or something like that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know what to make of that. I, I tried to not give him much attention. <laughs> uh, okay. And um, well, we can talk about that for just a little bit. Those what you were calling visual hallucinations. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> the way that I was introduced to this process was through the Bander and Grinder's um, NLP. Uh, and I understood it as a concept, but then I began to see this when I uh, later was more deeply into meditation okay or let us say more active in meditation or more frequent in meditation or something like that so the the point is is that we all have visual hallucinations but that those visual hallucinations are often very very short mm and they last only about a mind moment and sometimes those visual hallucinations are nothing but a color or mm. a vague image sometimes had, it's something in motion go ahead i was just saying that i've had i've had colors appear before uh for short moments and then i i noticed it and i snap out of it out of fear it has happened before like uh, i don't know many months ago maybe even that, years ago, that's I don't know, but, interesting. Uh, that's very but, interesting. You snap out of it out of fear when, in fact, the mind has been doing that, and in fact, that's a normal functioning of the human mind. I see. Yeah, so but, when, uh, uh, like the these ones were different. It wasn't like colors. It was uh, shapes. I want to say like geometric. So I had like these, uh, I don't know how to describe, but like, imagine like, uh, like this is like a line, this is a pen, but uh -huh. imagine like I had lines coming from like the side of my field of vision uh, and they were like coming like this and like this in a circular shape okay. and uh, they kind of converge upon a circle. So like one converts here, then this line converts here and here and here and they uh, kind of like rotate slowly like this, and they make the most perfect circle I've ever seen in my whole life. And this wasn't uh -huh. uh, 
this wasn't blurry or fuzzy or distorted or it was very sharp very precise like you know mm -hmm. like 4k full hd quality like just like i'm saying i, like, I understand when yeah. you're telling me this yeah. it sounds a little bit like one of the scenes that is often done in the star wars movies <laughs> when the uh, uh, Han Solo machine goes into hyper or warp or whatever yeah. uh, high speed, and then the stars begin to shape or they begin to elongate. Yes. And and uh, and the convergent point is wherever the rocket ship is going. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, the the point is, is is yes, we do have these visual things that happen. And we use those as part of the thought process that we have. Mm -hmm. That uh, that um, uh, that in fact a way of thinking of the sankara or the way that even thinking of past or the way that even thinking of memory, or uh, any of that uh, way of talking about it, is is that what we store and then pull back are only the same things that we have input with. In other words, a, uh, a, a laptop or a PC, the hard drive does not create, the hard drive itself does not create new data and put on the hard drive, All right? Mm -hmm. The hard drive is only a storage mechanism and the only thing that the storage mechanism is do is to store input in various bits and pieces, okay? What means that is, is that when we think, we think the way that we receive input, which means that um, we think visually because we see and interpret things visually, that humans are actually quite visual to where dogs are much more olfactory. Their primary method seems to be uh, odor. Um, that in fact, when a dog goes to look at something to inspect it, he always inspects it by sniffing it rather than mm -hmm. by, by looking at it. A human will take and they'll do this. The dog will do that when we're trying to, to get something. This is an important quality to understand that the, these visual things that are stored in the mind were stored because that's the kind of way that the mind works. We store visions, we store um, uh, sound, but we don't store very well smell. We're not very olfactory oriented that way for some reason, our species. And it could be the fact that once we stood up and started walking around, now we're uh, four to six feet above the ground for our nose to where the dog, he's got the ability mm -hmm. to put his nose right to the ground, which is uh, basically odors are very heavy molecules are distinct. Mm -hmm. And so they can fit in. Um, but anyway, um, an example of that, for instance, is, is that it's hard for you to conjure up and remember what something smells like, but you can actually easily remember, for instance, what lemons looks like. But it's a little bit hard to see what it what it smells like. We have to actually spend some time to recreate that. The same thing with a rose. It's easy to identify looking at a rose so that you can see it. But do you remember what it smells like? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So not only do we only store input, but we store it in this in the kind of um, importance or um, um, Priority. value that that we have uh, as that input devices. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> the visual inputs are actually, because we're so visually oriented, many times the visual constructions are very, very quick. In other words, you can have a visual image of something, maybe a story, maybe a joke, and all you remember is just an image. But then it takes three or four, maybe 30 seconds or for a minute or so to tell the story that that image has is just a flash. You've heard things like an, um, that a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Yeah. Actually, that's <laughs> that's very conservative. <laughs> very small number. Um, <laughs> yes, nice old number, exactly. Uh, but 
the point is, is then we normally have a sequence of C feel. Mm-hmm. Often we will only we will also have a feel describe or talk about it and then feel. But one of the things that's important for us to understand is is that we uh, we as humans are feeling beings and we're often driven by feelings about things rather than the actual object itself. Mm-hmm. In other words, if a child is not a, uh, has never seen a wolf before, when he sees the wolf, he's not afraid of the wolf because he's yeah. got no storage about connection. Wolves about it yeah Yeah. those those connections okay so now we can actually when i even use the word wolf you probably created more than one image of a wolf in your Mm -hmm. mind yes i didn't know i actually didn't notice (laughs) as as you said it yeah yes joe did you notice that you actually created images of wolves in your mind and they were very fleeting and very fast yeah yes that's the whole point is, is that we begin to pick up and see that stuff happening kind of in real time and recognize instead of, oh, no, look at that. It's, oh, so that's how the mind operates is a much better attitude. So we're uh, basically um, beginning to change our attitude because, in fact, our attitudes are stored. And the kind of attitude that people normally have is the kind of attitude that's built up over time in the sense of a um, a life script mm-hmm. or the way that we do things. And so we store visual, we store audio, we store um, um, other uh, sensations. For instance, uh, if I use descriptions of certain sensations in the body like sharp or throbbing, you know those words, uh, and you know actually the feelings that are associated with it, that there's a sharp piercing sensation is different than a dull aching, and the aching actually has to do with throbbing, and it normally throbs at the at the pulse of the heartbeat, so that as the blood pressure comes up and down, the sensations will change, all right? And so we have... Um, these kinds of things also stored as part of the Sankara. And and so uh, this is going in uh, directly into the level of what Joe's question was, is, is that sometimes because we've got an event coming up, that we will have a story that we're telling ourselves about the future event. It could be a date, it could be an interview, it could be a job performance review, it can be getting your your driver's license. It doesn't matter what it is, but what we do with that is that we attach importance to that thing, and then whoever it is that we're going to go deal with, we've also put them as an authority figure over us, that they've got something that we want. And so by having that kind of stuff stored in as advanced, we can recognize that we don't have to deal with situations like that. That there's um, that in fact, if you have any meeting or any appointment with, with anyone for any reason at all, then the best way to have thoughts about it is is that we have thoughts with the intention of being friendly and enjoy the conversation, and that's all the planning that we need to do. But we get used to doing things, say in high school. Uh, kids who study for a test by cramming will then uh, later in life when they go to have an interview, they will cram for that interview. And often their cramming time is full of, um, let us say, um, tension and anxiety, and they didn't need to know any of that stuff anyway. Mm -hmm that there's a much better way to study for an exam, and that is sit in class and pay attention. <laughs> so can, can I can I jump in for a second? Yes, go right ahead. 
Okay, uh, so I, I I sort of realized this, and I I tried thinking friendly thoughts, and I'm still trying to think friendly thoughts. And I like last night it was going pretty well. I was kind of meditating and was like trying to send friendly thoughts both to myself and to my thought of this person. Um, and then it's like it just keeps coming back. It's like a constant like internal like negotiation that's going on is the one thing and then the other thing is is that uh sometimes when i actually have the interaction and i'm really friendly i feel like i just get run over and that i'm just a pushover and like in this specific interaction like the last time that i interacted with him i i, I really was friendly and, and nice and uh and i i just got sort of run over and didn't really because I, I, I basically I'm, I'm, I'm digging a pond and I, I need to get permission from a government official about it. And he very much takes his job seriously. And uh, yeah. So anyways, that's that's just kind of that. <laughs> OK, um, so he's the guy who's going to be giving you a permit to dig a pond. Is that? The, yeah, that's, the... that's it. Yeah. All right. Uh then in some ways you want to give him the feeling or let him uh, have the feeling that in fact he is in charge. Yeah. Because he's, uh, you know, he's got his own standards or ways of doing things and things like that. And that he's going to give you the permit again. Uh, that if you've already met him before, then he's already spelled out what he wants from you. And the getting ready for the meeting is getting that stuff done, not thinking of the excuses that you're going to give him for not having done. That's yeah. another way of looking at it. Okay, so uh, being well prepared for the meeting includes the point that uh, the most important point about the meeting is is that you're going to get along with this guy and make friends with him that's the number one goal of the meeting because if he feels good he's going to give you what you want and if right. he feels okay. bad even if you've um let us say passed every step along the way and have done 100 percent of everything that he's required if you do that and tick him off you still got a problem. Right. Right. <laughs> but if you are, in fact, very friendly and, and courteous and uh, agreeable with him, then even if you don't have 100 percent of all of the stuff that he's asking for, you still have a good chance of getting it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I have I have everything that he's asking. I, I think he. He, he's a little bit of an older gentleman, and I think he maybe just doesn't take me very seriously because I, I kind of look like how with my long hair and my beard and stuff. And I don't know. But, yeah, but I, I still can try to be nice, though, and try and convince him that I'm a serious person and that I'm not, like, you know, messing around or something. Are but. you sure? <laughs> if, if that If that's the case then maybe uh, the pond that you're talking about is important enough to go to a barber shop and get a really good job done. No, I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> up, up to you. Up to you. <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, but this whole idea is that if we dwell on, and not dwell, but in fact the passing moments of uh, past and future that you have, would be the, oh, no, I've got that meeting. Oh, no, what's going to happen, which is normally the way that a child will think of uh, the meeting is because they come from the perspective of being a victim. Yeah. The way that you can have it is when those thoughts of the meeting come up, you can have it. Yeah, I can handle that. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be no no issue to it. Yeah. Okay. The, it, we do have um control over the way that we think when we remember to yeah this is what sati is all about if we can't remember in other words if we get stuck in the oh no i've got to deal with this guy and he's already run over me 
Okay, you can see the attitude that comes with that. And so there's an attitude of aversion rather than the attitude of friendliness. Right. So dealing with him in your own mind in a friendly way before you deal with him actually is the habit that we want to start creating. If if you uh, if if you were um, angry and upset uh, thinking about him the day before it, then it's going to be more difficult to right. put down that anger and upsetness. I know. And then go deal with him. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, the, and I, the thing- and I often, could I just say, I, I often do this with, with other things in life and I, it's like, I, I, I notice it, but then it just, it just stays for quite a long time and it just comes back and then it stays and like getting a real shift there and getting like, getting this sort of like, uh, frustration that I have like out or like changing it, I find really difficult, um, it's it's easy when I don't have to deal with like real world stuff like what I what I consider like what whatever whatever my personality structure has decided is important. Uh, I, I just I don't know why I still find it difficult because like practicing in other situations, it's quite easy and yeah. But then when I get into situations like you know this or interacting with you know in other situations uh, i really struggle and i don't know if that okay. changes with practice or so you've but it's been a lot two... a lot of years of, of this so <laughs> mm-hmm. so you've used two words yeah. struggle <clears throat> yeah. and frustration yeah are those not the same thing yeah a little bit i guess yeah. Okay. All right. So one of the things that kind of interesting about frustration is that there's a catch 22 to it in the sense of the catch 22 means that you can't get from here to there with frustration. In other words, frustration creates frustration. So if you're frustrated with your frustration, you're adding to it. Okay. Um, another way of thinking about it uh, is like with a hook. All right. And the frustration is like being hooked. And then the struggle is to pull back and forth like this because you're struggling and you're pulling all right but the right way to unhook things is always to give it some slack uh it doesn't matter whether this is a crane operator or whatever it is if you've got a hook or a hoist the only way to unhook something is by giving it so much slack that is easily removed from the hook This is also true with frustration. In other words, if you see frustration and you don't like frustration, you're going to continue to create frustration. If you have anxiety and you don't like the anxiety, the very thing of anxiety is is that you're not liking something. So now whatever it was that you were not liking that gave you anxiety and now the meditator sees the anxiety, he doesn't like that which is creating even more anxiety. This is quite typical, and every student has this. So remember that analogy. How are you going to unhook yourself? Are you going to just keep dragging and pulling the way that a child would? That in fact, um, uh, children, they're easy to play um, games with, like tug of war. And this happens also in other things like that is that you're both of you are struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling and pulling and pulling. But what happens if the one who has got some wisdom com- completely lets go? Not not com- yeah, not, not let go of the rope or whatever that you're pulling, but letting go of the tension so that it becomes completely relaxed. All right. And that will then uh, almost take the other person off balance so that now you can pull. Okay. This is also the way that we want to deal with frustration. 
rather than struggling with it, that we're going to start playing a game with the frustration. Because these frustrating feelings are just uh, initially just old stored feelings in the sense that they're memories. You know what it's like to feel frustrated. You started feeling frustrated when you were a child, and now you've got a, quite a habit of it. And so the way that you deal with frustration is with frustration, which is typical. That's why people remain frustrated rather than letting go of it. Uh, now, how do we let go? That's interesting. I mean, you can see the analogy that if I'm pulling on a rope with a child pulling on the other end, the easy thing is to let them get off balance by letting them have it and then pulling it back. This is exactly the entire art of jujitsu. You probably heard jujitsu. Okay. There's there's also another tradition that I'm more familiar with called Goju Rai, and you can hear that Jew in there. That Jew is give. Okay. So we want to start playing with the mind the way that we would play jujitsu, and that is to give into it to trip it up. So basically what jujitsu is all about is merely standing out of the way and let that force go. So if somebody's trying to punch you in the nose, you just move your head like that and let that force go like that, and then you can grab his arm and pull him off balance. So that's one of the ways that uh, uh, the jujitsu operates, but we can use that because it's physics, but it's the physics of the mind. So how are we going to learn to deal with frustration? Well, we've talked about making friends with these things. We've talked about um, that, in fact, in the suttas, one of the, uh, it's the fourth knowledge. The fourth knowledge is the knowledge that it is okay to see the dukkha and to um, let us say, make amends to it or uh, reparations or repair or another word that we can use is rehabilitation. So we want to rehabilitate the frustrations. That's the way that we're going to deal with them by giving them enough room. So another way of talking about it then is, is that if we can see the dukkha clearly, then we know how to trip it up. But if we do not like the dukkha and try to resist it and push it back, then it will just create more dukkha, more frustration, more anxiety, right? By fighting with it on the inside, you've got now you're fighting with your own tension and anxiety. <laughs> and this is very common. This is what we mean by frustration is because we don't see a way out. It doesn't matter how much we struggle or how hard we pull, we're still stuck with the same stuff. And what we need to do instead is give it some slack. And the way that we do that is instead of uh, not liking it and trying to get rid of it and trying to resist it coming in this direction, we want to actually help it come in this direction. What is that? In the direction of let it um, uh, be your friend. Invite it in. Allow yourself the time to really inspect it, to let it go in that way. <clears throat> but in fact, recently I've been using uh, an analogy that comes in the form of a song. Have you ever heard of Simon and Garfunkel? Yeah. Okay, and they had a song that was very famous called The Sound of Silence. Have you ever heard, heard that, that song? song? No, I haven't heard okay. that Okay. The opening line of it is, Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Surely mm. you've heard those lines, okay? Now, when I was a teenager and I heard that song, it sounded to me like that this teenager singing the song, grabbed his guitar, went into his bedroom, and turned the lights out, and that's the darkness. He's trying to get away from it all. But there's a more sophisticated way of looking at it, and that is that the darkness 
is actually the parts of our own mind that we have not looked at because we don't like it. It's our darkness. Your frustration is your darkness. Yeah. Okay. And so we need to then take that analogy and start recognizing that the right way to deal with frustration is by treating it like an old friend when it comes, because it really is an old friend. You just didn't like it very much before. Yeah. Okay, so now the way to deal with frustration is by um, investigating it and see what it really is like. Is there any bodily component to the frustration? Like anxiety is often held in the chest. In the the neck, yes. The neck is also a favorite place. And then, in fact, when the question arises, why does tension arise in the neck? The answer to that can be uh, by asking another question. Why do the biggest, toughest lions have manes? To protect... uh... To protect the neck, exactly, to protect the neck. Okay, so the next question along that line would be, well, where do lions go for the kill? What is the kill, the attack kill? Not the jumping on the back kill, but the attack, the kill attack, okay? That's the neck. So now you're saying um, that, oh, that's maybe the point that we can say about why do people have neck tension? is because they're actually trying to protect. Mm. Okay, there's something dangerous there. And so when people have neck tension, that's just a physical manifestation of the fear that is already in the chemistry of the blood in the body and that that chemistry was kicked off by the mind, but we often don't even remember because it was fleeting or whatever. And all we're left with is the telltale stuff that's in the body. There's a feeling of um, being set upon, feeling of frustration to where those are just old, familiar feelings, but we don't like them, but they are family. So the first thing that we need to do is to start treating them like family, like they are familiar, and let them become really familiar because we're really now investigating it to the to the to the depths. So just like going back to Goenka, just like Goenka recommends, because now we've talked about the underlying stuff that's going on with that. This is why in the meditation, the students are invited to really inspect the body, not just for sensations of the body, but also for the locations of the anxiety and the tensions and the frustrations and all of that kind of um, uh, emotional stuff that is associated with the body. For instance, anger is not a merely mental thing. That when someone is angry, there will be physically co- physical components. One of them is, is that we will ball up our fist. We will tighten the neck. Someone will suck in the gut. Other things like this will happen when we get uh, angry. And what do we call that? Tense. In other words, we tense up the body. But it happens subconsciously or it happens with a part of the mind that we're not paying attention to. So now as a meditator, you're beginning to see that tension. You can say, hot dang, I see you finally. I see you, old friend. You've come to talk with me again, I see. (laughs) And this time we're really going to listen. We're really going to pay attention to it. That's the way of dealing with the frustration is to recognize that something very fast can happen in the mind that then then almost like that there is a, um, um, let us say, a faucet in the brain and that it takes um, that faucet turns on adrenaline. It's done through the mechanism of the penal and the pituitary glands that are in the back of the, uh, the head communicating directly with the adrenaline gland that is sitting on top of the kidneys in the back here. And so there's a direct connection between them. And so this stuff, by the way, happens very, very fast. It's intended to be fast. This is the high speed reaction that keeps you alive sometimes. 
and it was designed originally in the sense of those people who did have a quick reaction to danger survived, and those who had a slow reaction to danger were eaten. So this is their, our biological component, that this stuff happens really, really fast, but um, the reaction then that we have to being eaten is real, and it happens immediately, except it was all imaginary. It didn't happen in reality. There actually are no pythons on the floor. There is no alligators crawling up the steps onto the porch, right? That's the whole idea is, is that our memories of seeing things will spark um, our, let us say, reflex actions. This actually, the reflex action we're talking about is an instinctual reaction, and the instinct is the self-preservation instinct, right? And that that instinct is triggered and it's intended um, through evolution to be very fast because when it's slow, we get eaten. So we need to react in a, in a very quickly. This is why the frustration will appear before you even know that it's appearing. That is already there. That's because it comes up that fast. So the question is, as a meditator, are you also fast enough to be there for it when it is actually going through this arising cycle? When when we notice the anxiety or whatever as manifesting in the body with a tension here, whatever, uh, w would the uh, procedure be to uh, say contract or perhaps like relax that uh, body part, like perhaps with a long deep breath, relaxing breath, something like that, so that the mind starts learning that. Uh, there's no need to produce what it's producing uh, and uh, rewire, I guess, the brain. Yes, that way. you use the correct word precisely, and that is relax. Or another word to use is to nurture. In other words, you begin to take the part of the mind that was involved with the frustration, which is almost always a critical parent. Uh, mentality, mm -hmm. critical thinking. Uh, the critical thinking is, oh, that guy's going to cause trouble again. Oh, that guy wants this, that, and the other thing. Oh, that guy is so hard to deal with. These are the kind of critical thoughts that then put the child part of our feeling area back into the feelings that we had when we were a child. And so uh, we can see that this, in fact, is a two-step punch, that the the um the anxiety and the frustration doesn't arise on its own something triggered it mm -hmm. and that normally what happens is that when people do see that stuff their natural reaction is is to hit that same trigger again mm -hmm. what we need to do is intentionally and consciously come back to the point of uh, a worthy investigation, but the worthy investigation is not going to be easily done by something that's resisting the investigation. So mm -hmm. the investigation, again, the best way to do the investigation is back to a friendly way, is to come to being friends with the frustration. That's it. Can you become friends with the frustration? Once you have the attitude of being friends with the frustration, now we can do an inspection of the frustration. Where is it? You know, is it here? Is it here in the neck? Watch that tension. If there is tension in the neck, can I roll my head around and play with it? Can I feel that tension? Is it more on one side or the other? Can I put some muscle rub on it and, and rub the neck and allow the neck to feel nice and comfortable? I mean, if you've been giving yourself tension over this one thing, how many times have you been giving yourself neck tension over a wide variety of things? So now giving it a massage, putting some muscle rub on and, and relaxing and saying everything is going to be all right. 
Mm-hmm. This guy does not have me by the throat. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and it's a nurturing. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying there needs to be, uh, so there's a recognition of the anxiety as an emotion on the mind. Then there's the recognition of its manifestation on the body. Uh, mm-hmm. Then there must be a process of friendliness in the sense that to not develop aversion towards that uh, emotion being there, which is not going to be very pleasant. Uh, so there needs to be practice to not develop uh, aversion towards it. And then uh, I guess the process of attenuating or or uh, uh, relaxing it uh, through okay. whatever, a deep breath or a massage in, or whatever. Uh, is okay. this somewhat a- uh, correct or? All right, so in a way, the the way of talking about it then is um, relaxing it or making it okay. In other words, we become friends with it before it's relaxed. Yes. Hello, yes. darkness, my old friend, or hello, tension, my old friend. Boy, I'm glad I can see you again because otherwise you've got me by the throat. But now that I can see you, I can massage. And not only can I massage with my hand, but the whole part of the whole point of massaging one's body with the hand like that to remove the tension is is that now you have the mental um, position of nurturing. That's why you're using the hand like this is to nurture the body. And so we can we're uh, taking the attitude change from being a victim of this guy and being frustrated. And now we're a victim of our own frustration. And so we're moving from victimhood to victimhood to victimhood. Mm -hmm. When we can see that victimhood also, hello, Mr. Victim, my darkness, my old friend, I can see (laughs) that I have, I deal with things as a victim, which means that I am struggling and pulling on this rope while really I'm being pulled around by it. And I'm struggling to hold on to something that's dragging me around. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's actually yeah, it's interesting because like there's a there's a uh, it has been recognized that when we, for example, say if we hug ourselves, uh, the mechanisms of hugging, the touching, and the the association with of the hug uh, creates a similar positive uh, attitude uh, or state as if someone were to be hugging us in that same uh, gentle way. So I guess when we do the nurturing like uh, of the neck, it's uh, it's it's doing that. Uh, yes. And by the way, my neck right now feels attitude. so much better than it did just two minutes ago. <laughs> 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 that yeah. nurturing is still going on. Wow, it feels so good. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is the way that begin to approach this, because as you can see, that when the frustration starts, now the thoughts are in line with them. So you'll continue to have thoughts about that guy and having more frustration and then more thoughts about him and more frustration. And you think that all the frustration that I have now will go away if I could only figure out what to do or how to deal with that guy. So let me dwell on how to figure out that guy so that the frustrations will go away. Well, okay. generally what I, what happens for me is I, I tend to think if I just practice correctly, if I, if I, if I just, I'm not practicing correctly, I must be doing something wrong. I'm noticing, but then I'm, I'm not knowing what to do from there. And then, and then it sort of gets into this berating pattern of like berating me for being a bad Buddhist practitioner. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And yet you've heard it said before, um, that, that famous story is in the half sutta that the Buddha, uh, had with Ananda where Ananda comes from Sariputta and says, Sariputta says, friendship is half the Dhamma. And the Buddha moaned. No, friendship is the whole thing. Normally, what we mean by friendship is friendship with the outside world. But it's very hard to be friends with the outside world if we're not friends with the inside world. That, in fact, if we're not friendly with ourselves on the inside, what that means is that we are artificially creating boundaries or separations 
in the mind so that we wind up being a crowd. We'll have this thought, and that's against that thought, and this thought is against that thought all over the place. And what we mean by this friendliness is let's begin to make friends with the darker parts. Let's start nourishing even the critical part. Let's start unifying the mind and making ourselves friends within the parts so that we unify the mind through friendship. And by doing so, then we can deal with the outside world with that same friendship for unity's sake. So uh, this whole idea of duality versus unity, you've heard that old argument, it's a spiritual argument that's going on for centuries. And people think about it's them against the world. And that's the duality. No, the real duality is the crowd inside. That's the duality. Is the the number one, the frustration, and number two, the one who dislikes the frustration. That's two of the crowd in there. We need to bring a third one in, uh, in the sense of making the change or tweaking it so that when frustration arises, that too can be nurtured and and integrated and recognizing it. Yes, I do have a a feeling of tension in my neck or a feeling of uh, emptiness in, in the belly, but those feelings are not going to interfere with my relationship with that guy. That in fact, I'm going to deal with those feelings and integrate them in now. So I can begin to feel that neck and feel that tension and do the relaxation, go to the gut, rub your belly, Massage, uh, let yourself know that empty deepness, uh, um, emptiness in there is just a sensation caused by chemicals that are controlled by the mind and delivered often with either the lymph nodic system or the lymphs work through the blood system. But this is the way that it all happens is, is that these chemicals are turned on and off and uh, critical chemicals are different than nurturing chemicals. And so coming back to hello darkness, my old friend, coming back to nurturing, coming back to, yeah, there's tension, there's anxiety, never mind. So what? I can deal with tension and anxiety easily. I've dealt with it for years and survived. Now I can deal with it happily. (laughs) And so this is the mental change of attitude. And as you've noticed in this talk, we've talked much more about the feelings, the feelings of stress, the feelings of tension, the feelings of uh, struggle, the feelings of frustration. But we can also look at it from the perspective of these feelings are created by our thoughts. And you can see that, that in fact, you can start thinking about this guy. And as you do, you work your feelings up. It's almost like uh, um, a hand pump. And the more thoughts you have on that, then the more pumped up with anxiety and tension and frustrations you get until it becomes so big that you can't. It's it's almost like... um, When you're starting to blow up a balloon, whether it's done by the mouth or the machine or whatever, the first important thing is is that our intention is is played with filling the balloon, pumping, getting the thing right. But that changes very quickly into we no longer pay attention to the filling of the balloon. Now we're paying attention to the balloon being filled, different perspective. Okay, so that happens in the mind that in the beginning, we're pumping, we're beginning to fill the mind with all those thoughts about, oh, it's going to be a tragedy, I've got so much work to do, that guy's going to be pissed off, you know, all of those kind of thoughts that come with the pumping. And now we're taking the mindset and putting it on, look what we have just pumped up. <laughs> is that, is the order all, is the, that is, is the order... Uh, because it seems that, so I first realized the, that a thought leads to an emotion and then an emotion leads to a bodily sensation. But now I'm starting to, f- to notice that the other, the opposite direction also happens. That there's a bodily sensation that then gets 
it leads to an emotion and then that leads to a thought. But Absolutely. I'm wondering if that's just like, uh, if, if, I don't know, if there's like, if there was a thought prior to the original bodily sensation that I just didn't notice. And the order is always the same, what if it goes like like this and like this. So uh, um, it seems to go both ways, uh, or uh, there's a possibility to go both ways. Right, but. and in fact, we're talking about uh, step seven now of Anapanasati, is to begin to see this connection is a two-way road, a two-way street, that uh, anger and frustration will create a way of thinking and a way of thinking will create anger and frustration. We can see many examples of that. Mm -hmm. uh, one example of it is, is that when people are angry and frustrated, they can't think straight. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so in debates, one of the things to do is to get uh, your opponent on defense. And so... Um, attacking not his point of view or his debate topic, we attack him instead and bring his ego mm -hmm. into it. And that will then get his mind onto him rather than on topic. Mm -hmm. All right. And so that's why there's a rule, no ad hominem attacks in um, uh, debates, which means now we have to find other ways to get his ego involved because we can't attack him directly. One of them is is winking and flirting with him because that will get his ego involved also. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the, the point that we're making is, is the there are conditioners. If you feel sick, your body is sick, that will con that will condition how you feel and what yeah. you think about. Yeah. Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa talks about it in the sense that when the body is sick, that's an excellent opportunity to practice. That's like going to the gym and going to the back alley there where the big weights are. And let's mm -hmm. do some big weight pumping right now. Why? Because we're sick. I mean, we're, here we are with these weights. Let's exercise. Let's uh, get the mind back pumped back up again. In other words, if the body can make that sick can make the mind sick, then we can then make the mind well, which will then help the body get well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we I mean, even know that, change. we Sorry, need to know yeah. that exactly that. In fact, the doctors are still flabbergasted with spontaneous remission of cancer. Yeah, I think How it, it has that been. A, it has been. Go a, ahead. Uh, it has been a recognize that that uh, like people who are in uh, good mental mental states heal much faster than those who are in constant negative mental states and uh, that sort of stuff so uh, th there is that connection there that yes we do there, yeah. we're beginning to see that at a scientific physiological level that the Buddha wrote down in or didn't write down but he he, he talked about it in the uh, in his description of Anapanasati that the the feelings of Vedana conditions the Sita and the Sita conditions of Vedana the Vedana conditions the body the or the Kaya and in it is a is a circle around there of conditioning and so if we have a thought that drags us down into bad feelings and we dwell in those bad feelings the body will begin to get lethargic also yeah. In other words, we have defeating thoughts, then the defeating thoughts will give us defeating feelings, and that will defeat the body also, that we yeah. literally can make ourselves sick. Yeah. And we can also heal ourselves mm -hmm. if we are able to change our attitude about mm -hmm. it. And this is the whole idea, then, of nurturing the body when it's sick rather than criticizing the body when it's sick. If we mm -hmm. criticize the body when it's sick, it's going to get sicker. Yep. If you criticize your emotions, then your emotions are going to get sicker. Mm -hmm. If we nurture our, our um, uh, broken emotions, they will heal. If mm -hmm. we nurture our broken body, it will heal. That's mm -hmm. the whole idea of... Um, and and they it's called the power of positive thinking, but this is not positive thinking. This is nurturing thinking. An example of positive thinking of, oh, you're not sick. 
you're okay. Get up and go to school. Mm. Okay. <laughs> that's positive thinking. That's not what we're talking about. The, the the nurturing is oh you poor dear you're so sick ha ha <laughs> <laughs> and so dealing with reality we're not trying to cheer the mind up by telling ourselves lies we're here cheering ourselves up with the reality that cheering ourselves up is beneficial mm-hmm. I think this this kind of reminds me of uh, when Johnny was talking about. Uh, sorry, I'm probably saying your name wrong. Uh, no, that's correct. That's good. Okay, okay. Uh, but when you were saying that on retreat on day three, that you just became okay with the pain, that it sort of reminds me of that that attitude shift because you you weren't you weren't like shifting it in a positive mindset and saying. Oh no, we'll just get through this. But it sounded like from what you were saying that it was more like, well, the pain's just there, and that's just my yeah. reality right now. Um, yeah. But I, I'm okay just, with it. Yeah, I just stopped resisting it. Mm-hmm. I think that's the best way to put it. I just stopped wanting it to not be there, and then it, it, yes, it was there, and it was fine. Uh, right. So that's the change of attitude. We're no longer resisting. We're no longer standing in the way of that punch. Mm. But we're we're stepping aside and let it miss us. Yeah. Okay. We're not resisting it anymore. That we're uh, uh, st- instead of using the word letting go, uh, uh, perhaps even a more uh, striking way of of uh, speaking about it is to stand aside. Mm. Let it miss you. Um. The example that I sometimes use is imagine that you're standing on the highway and a big truck is barreling down. He's even blaring his horn. Okay. And the meditator looks up and sees the truck coming. There are three possible outcomes. One is that we stand there and let it run over us, which is normally what we do. And this is called choiceless awareness. Oh, I'm frustrated. Oh, I'm so frustrated, you know. And then there's the Popeye. He's going to eat his can of spinach and he's going to stand there and he's going to stop that lorry from hitting him. He gets run over too. <laughs> but this one's the one who struggles against it. Oh, you should not be frustrated. Oh, you got to stop that. You know, that's that mentality. But that one's a little bit smarter than just getting run over with it. That in fact, many people dedicate themselves to meditation, working too hard, struggling with it, but they're going to make a bit more uh, progress than the ones who just keep getting run over by their own mind. There's a third way, and that's to stand aside. Just get out of the road. Just say, you can't touch me. Just get out of the way. This is the way of thinking about it. That's the easy way. Okay, now what that means is, is stepping out of the road means stepping out of the conflict in whatever regard we think of that conflict to stand aside, which means now we're beginning to nurture. We, in fact, can cheer that Lord. Yeah, go, boy, go. Yeah, you've gone. <laughs> you've gone. <laughs> and so that's... That in fact, that that point is the point that um, is important within the context of, um, let us say, the uh, the adept practitioner rather than the wrong student. And that is, is that we begin now to pay more closely attention to the things that are falling away, rotting away, going away, that in fact, we begin to uh, appreciate frustration by only seeing its backside as it disappears, as it leaves the scene. That's the way to start dealing with it is, is that instead of dealing with the arising, because that's the way that we normally did when we were children, we see things coming. Now we're going to watch things passing away. We see the arising. Now we're going to see stuff pass away. We can say, oh, that tension in the neck is just passing away. Yeah, there it goes. Okay, so this is another I'm so way of sorry. talking about it. Go ahead. I'm Go so ahead, sorry Johnny. to interrupt. I, I'm really sorry to interrupt. It's just that I have something to do in about two minutes, so I have to go. Um, but it was really nice talking 
with both of you. And, yeah, it's nice uh, meeting you. You too, man. Uh, and okay. yeah, Merry Christmas. I don't know. I don't know if that Murado celebrates that or not, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. thank you for uh, mentioning but, that. Yes, Christmas is a holiday, yeah. right? Every you, day you is say a you're holiday. on holidays yeah, all the time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm on. Yeah, I'm on holiday, right? So Christmas is just another holiday. Does that mean it's that you're here tomorrow? Because I might, I might, since I have like a couple of days of uh, free time myself. So maybe I'll call tomorrow as well. Maybe uh, if you're around, that would I don't know be if you're good, around. Johnny. Yes, right. Cool. Sounds good. Had, all right, I gotta go. To see you. Okay, Bye. Johnny. Bye bye. So, uh, Joe, we can we can go ahead and finish up. I think that we've kind of gotten the uh, uh, the point yeah. that uh, so we'll just do a short review. And that is, is that we are a crowd inside and that crowd is um, created by criticism. And that uh, the, the idea then is to become reunified and the way that we do that is with the intention and the attitude of becoming whole again, which means accepting the various parts that are within us with the idea of letting that stuff relax or to see it in, in hindsight as it passes away. This is the whole way of looking at it, because in fact, when we see it coming, that's the danger point. And if we merely step out of the way, then the danger will pass on by. And then we can say things like, miss me, can't touch me. That's the kind of the attitude that we have. The frustration, <laughs> nothing to it. Just unhook and off we go. And we keep developing those thoughts. So when, because the frustration is not gonna go away that quickly, but by playing with it, by taking a few short breaths, by recognizing the tension in the neck and massaging, uh, taking deep breaths, uh, this kind of stuff, and making these feelings, these um, frustrations, uh, toys to play with. Rather instead than of something to avoid. It. Yeah. Right, because of, yeah, when you're avoiding it, you're yeah. creating it. Yeah. Hang on a second. Kitty, price your name, ah. Okay. So, uh, have somebody in the yard. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I got to take care of that. But uh, anyway, um, let's go ahead and finish up with this with the with the idea that you can do this you in fact can change your attitude about it yeah that you can have friendly thoughts about your frustrations and you can have friendly thoughts about the guy yeah i got i got like an hour with. an hour left to before i have to meet him so <laughs> you can yeah, use that hour to practice uh thinking right. positive, positive. chill out yeah exactly just chill knowing that okay. everything is going to be all right okay, okay. thank you so much we'll, we'll see you yeah, yeah. joe we'll see bye -bye. you later bye-bye see you good luck